First, I want to thank Abby and the organizing committee for inviting me to give a talk in this meeting. I was here last year, and it was one of my favorite meetings, bringing these uh, three or four communities that we usually don't get together. So what I'm going to be talking is uh, results connected with numerical relativity simulations of black holes. But in the last few years, most of the attention has been on the gravitational wave estimates that these simulations have produced. What I'm going to focus now is on the horizons. I'm going to be talking about the impact that handling horizons had in the success of the simulations. And I'm also going to present some results about what happens inside these horizons. So let me start by a little bit of history. Uh, what, in my opinion, was the beginning of the golden era of numerical relativity simulations dealing with compact objects was in the early 90s. And here is a cover of uh, one of the two most important results at that time. One of them was the numerical studies by Mike Chopwick on the uh, critical collapse, gravitational collapse. And the other one was a result that came out of this alliance that were, uh, at that time, NSF uh, supporting Grand Challenge problems, and this was on binary black holes. And what you have here is the event horizon on the collision of two black hot holes head on. And what you see here are the null generator of the black hole. So what they happen, and let me just run the movie here so you see different angles, is that we did the simulation forward in time, saving the entire space time. Of course, it was a modest slab of space time. And then what we did is just retracing back in time. And then with that one, those photons that stay outside, those are the ones that define the horizon. And when the result that was unexpected is that instead of having a smooth uh, area here, it was actually a very sharp cost because they were when the generators leaving when they go back in time. So there were other results connected with black holes. For instance, the group in Pittsburgh at that time, what they did is they, again, did a simulation back in time of these white holes. And what you see here are snapshots. If this runs back in time, the simulation went this way, which you have two horizons. And then they actually uh, merge when they go back in time. But of course, moving forward in time, you see the white holes are actually splitting. Here again, these are event horizons in the sense that they save the entire space time and they run these event horizon trackers. Uh, this is another more recent. This is from the group in Vienna by Bernd Bruchmann in which you have, you can have now two black holes, one of them larger than the other one. And you can actually see that it's not ex exactly uh, uh, axisymmetric or, I mean, these tubes here that it has some spins, you have a, a much smaller black hole merging with a larger one. You can even see a little bit hints of how the final black hole relaxes as you reach the final stage, which is a Kerr black hole. All right, so, and this is, if you want, the current state of the simulations. This is the simulation of the event of the first detection of gravitational waves. We put the parameters that were observed, or the best estimate of those parameters. And uh, here, these blobs, it's the gravitational radiation. These two spheres here are the horizons. At this moment, I'm not saying that they are event horizons. I'll talk more about their apparent horizons that it was mentioned in the previous talk. But anyway, the, bo the bottom line is that now, in part of the simulations is the ability to track these horizons. And I'll mention why in a second. But before I do, oh, there you go. So this is uh, the two black holes. One of them is slightly larger than the other one. They are approaching. And uh, eventually you get to the point in which there is a common horizon. Notice that it appears instantaneously. I'll go back and talk about that in a second. But uh, so this is the current state of simulations in black hole mergers. So, the type of approach that we use is, as John Wheeler used to put it, geometrical dynamics. What we have is we have a slice of constant time. And essentially, what we do is we have equations that involve the spatial metric and the extrinsic curvature. And also, we have some conditions. And this is what I'm going to focus on this talk. We have conditions about the lapse function, that is, uh, the time that elapses from one surface to the next one. 
and we also we have this shift vector that tells us where a point P is mapped in the next time slot. And that was critical for the success of the simulations, and I'll mention in a second why. So, but how about the black hole singularities? At the time that this Grand Challenge Alliance started, this was the type of simulations that we were able to do. This is a single black hole in which we just put the Schwarzschild metric in, and after just not even 100 steps, immediately things start going bad, okay? And notice also that the computational domain was very modest. This is the horizon, and this is the outer boundary, and you see there are already problems there. In 2005, that was when the first simulations of the collisions of black holes came up, and that was a completely different story. So, you know, here again, you have the two apparent horizons, gravitational radiation, and so on. So what are the approaches to handle the singularity in the simulation? So one of them is called black hole excision. One takes advantage that the black holes that one is evolving have horizons, and hopefully nothing can leak outside of it. And basically, one just performs surgery in the computational domain, and by that, it's just zeroing out the part of the computational domain inside of the black hole. That's it, you don't evolve it. Now, as you can see here, that it's a jagged kind of uh, uh, area, because you have a mesh that you're doing the calculations. So even though you have a horizon that in principle, nothing physical should escape, you have to deal with numerics in this boundary. It can get very complicated. That was the first approach that we attempted uh, uh, 15 years ago. And it was tough to get all the algorithm, numerical algorithms to function in these boundaries because you need to have a discretization scheme of your equations that handle that jagged boundary. Nonetheless, there, there was some success. Here are three examples of that. So what I have here is a single black hole. And what you'll see is the black hole is going to go into a circular orbit around nothing. And the reason that it's around nothing, but what we're doing is just moving the coordinates. The black hole stays in one place. We just move the coordinates just to test how robust our numerical algorithm was. This one here, we did the same thing. We didn't boost the black hole. We just move the coordinates in a linear way, again, to test that everything that we do at the surface of the boundary was correctly handled. It was not perfect, but it did the job. And here is another example in which we had the collision of two black holes slightly uh, off from being head on. That is a grazing collision. So you will see that you know, things were working more or less OK. But uh, it turns out that the method that was the most successful when you are dealing with this type of numerical approach is not doing black hole excision, is not just cutting the domain and doing anything, but is basically avoiding the singularity. So for that one, let me just go and remind you that if you have, for instance, you write the Schwarzschild metric in isotropic coordinates and then you pick a slice in, that in a cross called, uh, in a pen diagram looks like this. So you go from uh, spatial infinity across the, 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 the horizon to the other infinity. You can evolve black holes doing that. So these are the different time slices of that. It is possible to evolve that. It is not very efficient. Why? Because, I mean, the space they were interested in is this here. And you had to have basically a copy of the domain in the other side. And with two black holes, we just don't know how to do it. But I mean, in principle, for a single black hole, people were able to do that. Uh, the bottom line is, again, that if you have multiple of these wormhole type objects, you're going to have to be able to provide a prescription of how you move forward in time and how your coordinates get shuffled around so the black holes don't get entangled and, and you lose the resolution. So the approach that has worked is one in which you do the following, okay? So here is again the same diagram, but instead you pick slices in time that are given by these uh, red lines there. So you have going to special infinity, you cross the horizon, but you avoid hitting the singularity by basically piling up the slices at uh, basically a radius of three, three half of M, so all the, sur all the surfaces there. 
Now, you, you could say, well, how do you handle doing numerical work and you're piling up things here? Because uh, what you're basically doing is making the labs here being smaller and smaller. You freeze the, evolu the evolution here. On the other hand, and each slide, you have to have grid points to be able to solve your equations, the Einstein equations, and you can have that as you pile these slices here, your points get closer and closer together and you run into trouble. Well, that's when this prescription came up, okay? And this is what is called the moving puncture uh, gauge. It was found by, a little bit by trial and error, and it turns out that up to 2005, the community had all of this except this term and this term here. Okay? So this is a little history of how it happened. So those two terms and those who do hydro, they look a little like advection type terms. And indeed, it's an advection of coordinates. It's how beta tells you how to advect the lab, so to speak, or how to advect this quantity. Okay? Now, what is the irony of these codes is that those terms, somebody code them there, but they never turn them on. Okay? One of the groups, they never turn those codes, and the codes keep crashing, you couldn't do anything. There was a postdoc that moved from the group in Germany to the group in, in NASA Goddard that arrived and made the mistake of turning those terms on, and there you go. The black holes actually merged, did everything they were supposed to be doing. So it was, it, and, uh, it's, it was an, just an amazing fact that the codes were so complicated that sometimes you make silly mistakes that actually work. Now, the other thing that is very uh, important is that the ability to follow where the black hole goes. And that one is actually this gauge provides, so this condition for these labs gives you that equation. This beta here that just tells you how to move the coordinates in subsequent slices, if you follow the beta where this black hole is, that is the equation of motion of the black hole in coordinate space. So we didn't have to do anything. You just integrate this very simple equation and that's it. All right, now there was mentioned in the, in the talk before about uh, horizons, apparent horizons. That is a very important ingredient in our simulations because even that we can follow with this recipe where the black holes go. We still want to calculate quantities connected to the black hole. We need to be sure where we put resolution. And for that one, we cannot do event horizons. We will have to evolve in space time. So what we do is we calculate this expansion. And remember, so this is one of the slides. If you have a surface, you, uh, you have an outgoing and ingoing null direction you can write that expansion not only in terms of those null directions, but also in quantities that you have at hand. So that is the normal in that hypersurface to the sphere, okay, and the normal to the hypersurface itself. And those are quantities that we evolve in the code. So that is a nice thing, that we don't have to do anything else. On the fly, we just compute these expansion factors, and that's it. Now, in the region, so a trapped surface is a region which both the ingoing and outgoing null uh, expansions are negative. Okay? The outermost is when the outgoing is zero. So we just calculate that everywhere and identify those regions and we're done. So those spheres, those uh, that you found that we call the horizon, are just calculated by finding the region where this, where this is. Okay. So now going, what we have is then, we go and look, as that's what I've just said, we go and look at regions where this is negative, outside is positive, and our codes basically identify this. If you go and stack them, and if you build the world tube of this, that is what is called a dynamical horizon. Now, these apparent horizons are slightly dependent. As you imagine, if you slide the space-time in a different way, you can have a different shape of the horizon, or you can even lose the horizon. However, once that you have the world tube, that is, can prove that it's slightly independent. Now, it has been a very useful, let me see here. It has been very useful for numerical simulations to use the, the, uh, to use the, the apparent horizons. Because, you know, there are formulas and one can compute the angular momentum, that is the spin of the black holes. 
you can compute the mass. Once you have the spin and the aerial radius of the horizon, you can compute the masses. And just to, here are two examples of an evolution of two black holes in which you can actually track the spins of the black holes as they emerge, as they evolve, and you can track their masses. And there are balance laws associated with that as well. All right, so now, here again is the merger. Notice again that instantaneously, there is a common horizon that appears. You can, basically it's here, when you have the, at the late spiral before the ring down, you have a instantaneous common horizon appearing. So you hold from a situation in which you have two apparent horizons to one in which you only have one, and again inside you have negative expansion of those, but then at the merger, you have a common horizon that appears instantaneously, but the situation is that if this is, again, an apparent horizon, that means that this region is negative. So how can you have negative here and a negative there and still this be an, uh, an outermost apparent horizon inside of that? So what happened is that there is a bifurcation when you have the instantaneous appearance of the common horizon, you not only have the apparent horizon up here, you have an inner horizon that is basically hogging these other, other, other horizons inside. And here is in a space-time type of diagram, here the, for a head-on collision, you have the two black holes merging each other, and the region in which, in the, the time at which you have the apparent horizon uh, appearing. Now this, we're plotting things in coordinates, don't get, uh, don't get uh, uh, worried that the, the size of the horizons increase or decrease, this is just the, the uh, plotting in the coordinate uh, uh, computational domain. And what I have here is just a movie of the heron collision occurs in this direction. This is one of the black holes. The purple is negative. The green is positive. So you can see that the region, this is the outermost apparent horizon. So the region between the this is a, one of the black holes and the common apparent horizon appears here, you will see that it starts being converted into a negative expansion region. All right, so how about this bifurcation? Well, here is another example in which when the apparent horizon appears, indeed, there is another one that is an inner horizon appearing that moves in. And uh, the interesting thing that we have observed, and now when we plot this in terms of the areas, as it was mentioned in the previous talk, the, apparent, the horizons grow, okay, in, in, in area. The ones in the interior stay constant even after the appearance of that. They don't disappear, they stay constant, and we don't understand that. Also here, it gives the impression that they merge, but it, they don't. We have not been able to find the end in which the, this, these two world tubes merge. The, let me skip this. Now, the last two slides, why is it that it's important to study this? Well, one of the things that this apparent horizon also tells us is about connection with the gravitational waves that are emitted. So what we have here is a collision of two black holes, just a very brief spiral. This is the gravitational wave, the amplitude. This is the way the in blue is the wave. At this point is when this common horizon appears, it is before the signal reach maximum, and at the end, there is when you have the quasi-normal ringing of the black hole. So one of the interesting things that is what we are finding is that the quasi-normal ringing, okay, quasi-normal ringing is, appears a little bit later, it does appear, than expected. So, and also that the phase, the way that it enters quasi-normal ringing is a little bit earlier than the amplitude. Now my last remark is that by connecting connecting the, the, the source multiples, that is the way that the black hole horizon is settling to the care black hole, to the gravitational waves, we're gonna learn uh, about how the, we enter the final state. So this is work by uh, Schneider and collaborators in which they calculated the multiples of the apparent horizon and they are correlating that with the gravitational weight that is emitted outside. So just to conclude, we have that the black hole horizons not only have help in the numerical sense to be able to control the simulations so to be able to understand where we put resources, computational resources and all that, but also 
to connect with the gravitational waves. And now what we're trying to understand is how these trapped surfaces that of the original black holes behave once that the common horizon has been formed. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a few questions. So people often talk about the ring down as the last phase after the mm -hmm. merger, but uh, at least with neutron stars, the ringing can start just due to the tidal force that mm -hmm. is exerted. Do you see the same phenomena in black holes that uh, they start ringing prior to the common horizon? Right, so that, it will be very difficult to, to detect in the gravitational waves, but uh, to, to detect the ring down of the merging black holes before the common horizon appears. I think that uh, we have not, uh, we don't have the resolution to be able to do that. And, uh, but it will be an interesting, uh, uh, perhaps the case that it will be uh, in, in which a trigger a larger effect will be of unequal mass black holes, or maybe adding some spins on that. But uh, we haven't looked at that. But I, I doubt that uh, with the complexity of the signal during, near the merger that we'll be able to pull out that. So, so I was a little bit confused when you had that picture about the apparent horizons when the two black holes merged. Yes. Um, you were talking about an inner horizon. But in your trumpet slicings, right, you have an outer horizon. But then everywhere inside, you have trapped surfaces, I thought. Right. Okay, so what do you mean by inner horizon? Well, uh, I, I use the wrong term. The thing is that this here, they are not, they are, th these things are not as strictly apparent horizons because they are not the outermost trap surface. This is the outermost trap surface. But at the same time, you can keep tracking these surfaces. Those remain. Okay. okay. They, they don't stop there. It's just, it just this, this, uh, this picture that you have here. So time runs in this direction. At this point, these are apparent horizons, individual apparent horizons. Then another common appears, but the fact that they're inside, strictly speaking, they're not apparent horizons, but you can, you can find yeah, But they're surfaces where the um, expansion is zero. The right. Expansion the thing is zero. that we don't understand is why do they stay there with a constant area and why they don't merge? They don't merge. As far as we have been able to push the simulation. Okay. Yes, at some point you said in one of your slides you were talking about the starting of the quasi-nova modes. Yes. Uh, can you actually um, be more explicit? What, how right. do you define was, uh, the starting and why you are saying was, that starts uh, earlier? Yeah, I was running out of time, so I did So, okay, this is when, when, you reach, when you reach the exponentially decay in the amplitude, okay, that is when you have quasi-normal ringing, right? So we, are, we identify the quasi-normal ringing when you just look at the phase, at the amplitude. It's somewhere here. But in the phase, it's a little bit earlier. There are the two things. The quasi-normal ringing is not only the decay, but it's also the constant frequency, right? So we see that the, the constant uh, frequency associated with quasi-normal ringing is already present here, even that the decay has not entered the exponential decay. That's all I'm saying. And I don't understand why. We were thinking that the two of them will enter at the same time. That's all I'm saying. Okay, we, yeah. we, 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 okay. is it a brief question? I think so. Okay. Um, so no, no one I think really believes that there's, if there's anything like a Kerr black hole that has all the crazy stuff inside the Cauchy horizon and closed finite curves and ring singularity. What do you guys use of, um, for, the, for the initial data for the uh, inside the event horizon for the two initial curve black holes. Right. So initial data we use this. So in one slide we basically so, use. Oh, so, so 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 you are doing Schwarzschild. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Right. I mean, uh, uh, we use a data that is conformally flat. We use the conformal factor of uh, basically of an isotropic, one, mm -hmm. and then we do the boosting of the black hole. But this does, this means uh, the fact that we don't go all the way to r equals zero, of course. We basically stop somewhere there, okay? And, uh, and since we don't in have infinite resolution, we don't have problems with that, okay? Okay, let's, uh, thanks Pablo again. Okay.